Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Samantha Stein. I'm the director of special projects and the startup battlefield editor at TechCrunch. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Sandy Kleiman. So Sandy has spent decades in the entertainment industry, crafting the storytelling we see today in film and across media. And he can also be credited for helping to bring Silicon Valley into the entertainment industry. So. Welcome, Sandy. You know, I'm just thrilled you guys are here. This is sort of the stalwart group, late afternoon. It's really hot. I think most people are out getting some vegetarian pad thai right now. <laughs> I'm just really happy you're here. And I also want to, just on the, the sense of future talks, I mean, I, it, whether it's the sessions or the individual conversations, um, it truly has been a remarkable experience in terms of the hope of the future. I mean, I look around here, and I, you know, we, we, you know, you, you watch in the United States uh, cable news. This is the best antidote to cable news I've seen yet, <laughs> because you are here and you're focused on really discussing the issues of our time. And it's not just climate change; it's education, it's AI, it's new materials, and also, hopefully, out of this future talks group will come uh, lifelong collaborations that will really change for the better, the way we live and the way our children and our children's children will hopefully experience life on this planet in a good way. So thank you all for being part of it. Sandy, storytelling has been a theme that's been recurrent and only built upon itself throughout your career. Can you tell us where did your passion for storytelling come from and how did that first show up in your career? You know, when you grow up in the Northeast Bronx, and for those from Europe, that's not a great place. <laughs> you, 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 you basically, you know, pretty much everything I learned early on was from movies and television and books. We had no money to travel. We had the sense of being in Oslo. I'm not sure that my neighborhood understood what Norway was, <laughs> let alone Svalbard and the Arctic. Um, the, I, I, I actually first saw a polar bear on its back in the Bronx Zoo eating a, a loaf of rye bread basking in the Bronx sun. <laughs> and it, the, the sense is that uh, when I got to college, I realized I knew more about the world from media than many of the people who had far more resources and had traveled the world with their families. And to me, um, the way we are going to bring people together is not, and, and more so today than ever, I think the internet, social media, the sense that we have reduced much of life to sound bites, stereotypes, in ways that are very negative, the way we're actually going to bring people together is if we see each other as human beings, and the best way to do that is storytelling. About um, a decade ago, maybe, I was uh, invited to the Dubai International Film Festival. And I think they put me on a panel only because I traveled that distance, because I was on a panel <laughs> with the heads of either production distribution for Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait. <laughs> and there was me. And the only film that they talked about, all three of them, and I encourage everyone here to see it, is a, a, a film made in Lebanese by a young woman director called Caramel. Mm. And it was the story of four women in a Beirut beauty salon. It was called Caramel because that's how they waxed at that beauty salon. They would apply Caramel and they would do the waxing to remove hair. And that story and the human condition, these, these women were sharing with each other, their loves, their lives, the, the sort of sense of humanity around them could have been any city in the world. And yet it was Beirut, and yet it was in Lebanese, and it's a film that just touches the heart. And it's very hard to create stereotypes when you touch the heart and tell stories about people. So Nadine Lepaki is the, the Lebanese the um, director, director and writer who produced that film. She also and who, by the way, never came to Hollywood, bless her heart. <laughs> bless her heart. Uh, and she's produced a number of other great films. You've worked on a number of films for which you've received international acclaim, including Aviator. Can you tell us a bit about that work and a bit about the technology you brought into your work from high tech in Silicon Valley and where those two are merging today? Well, you know, it, the, the thing that I'll say is I like to be anonymous and, and behind the camera more than anywhere else. And, you know, I was an agent for more time than I was anything else. 
And for those of you who worry what an agent is, Creative Artists Agency was one of the, the leading talent agencies and still is in the world. Although I must say, when I first went to work there, I realized I needed a suit. So I went to this Russian tailor who did discount suits. And I went in and I said, I'm going to go work at CAA. And he pulled out this book of materials and they were like wonderful pinstripes and very r relatively dull materials. And I'm looking at this going, oh great, I'm going to have a suit and this, I'm going to be able to go to work. And he said, and we're going to leave a little extra room here for the gun. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. I said, it's creative arts, it's a, it's a talent agency, it's not the CIA. And, and, and by the way, he then pulled out another, oh, he says, oh, and then like entirely new swatches of material came out. <laughs> and, you know, to me, I mean, I, the films that I'm most proud of are, are films like uh, River Runs Through It, was the first book I acquired. Uh, from my client Robert Redford, which basically was a story of fathers and sons set against Montana, and two brothers, one of whom uh, had a tragic end, never quite fit in, and the good son, who actually was the autobiographical, the fictionalized autobiographical story of the author Norman MacLean. And again, I think it's the sense that when a film like that, which was small and intimate and, and difficult to make, it went through three financiers, um, you, you had at the end of that movie a, a sense of much like Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner, which was the first film I worked on with Costner, uh, something that brought families together, a sense of, of, of intimacy between parent and child. And those are films that, that resonate and I think we need more of. The, the Aviator was just a gift in that, uh, you know, there... Uh, I mean, you look at that film and, and I, I marvel at it. Uh, it was originally developed by Leonardo DiCaprio when he was 20 with Michael Mann for Michael to direct it. Michael Mann directed, he brought you uh, to, to life, Miami Vice, the TV series, but Heat, Last of the Mohicans, Collateral, I mean, one of the greatest directors of all time. And my, Michael decided not to direct it and, and then we had to find another director, so we were fortunate enough having uh, just uh, Martin Scorsese, just having finished Gangs of New York with Leonardo DiCaprio, we were able to recruit Marty in to direct what was the Howard Hughes story. And the thing that I, that I was most drawn to about the film, because it's a very hard film, I mean, if you, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's, you know, when you have someone like Howard Hughes, the American industrialist, who basically was an iconoclast, and he was an outsider in the movie business, and he was an outsider in aviation. He was the consummate American entrepreneur who did not fit into the establishment. They tried to blackball him from Hollywood, and his competitors, including Juan Tripp at Pan Am while he was running TWA, tried to get him indicted for having overspent during the war on, on military uh, equipment, including the Spruce Goose. And at the end of the day, it was this marvelous story about someone who basically had mental illness. He had a, a, a complete phobia for germs. He was, you know, I guess, you know, OCD in, in many different ways. I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, there are doctors in the house who can describe, you know, an aberrant condition like he had. And yet he was a genius, but a genius who lost his mind at the end of the film. In fact, when we pitched the film, to my friend Jim Giannopoulos, who uh, at the time was running 20th Century Fox, he said, you know, I'd love to do this with you. He said, other than the fact that I'm worried about the budget, he said, I'm not sure how you end a film where your lead character loses his mind at the end of the movie. And uh, for those who know Hughes, he became a recluse. He was a very, very odd man who was very wealthy, but was almost absent from life at the end of his life. And the reality was that we were able to tell a story about a misfit who, through technology, changed the way movies were made, changed the way aviation came forward. He took risks no one else would take. And frankly, none of us would be flying here today without his work in aviation. So it, it, it's, it's the consummate story. And I also think, from the standpoint of future talks, it's the kind of story I hope you guys tell, whether you tell it in media or you tell it through your lives, is that you give a role model for others to follow. 
You know, the funny thing is, except they're not here with me now, I've always taken my two sons to literally every gathering like this that I, I could. And the reason I did is I did not want them to be anything like me because I was sort of the boring guy who got things done. I, by the way, when I started in the, in the entertainment business, I figured since I didn't do drug, sex, or rock and roll, <laughs> In excess, anyway. But is, no guns, is, so. is, 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 we, we, well, we won't go into the details here. But in any event, since I basically was the really boring guy, so at CAA, when the clients wanted a party, they would find their agent. When they had a problem, they would find me. Uh, is, is I wanted them to meet people who took a real joy in their lives and their work because I wanted them not to have taken the trajectory I took, but hopefully to take the trajectory each of you is taking, which is it's not about money, it's about finding a path in life that you are dedicated to and that leaves a positive footprint and that you can feel as if you've achieved something of great value through your life's journey. Wow. Oh, stop. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's funny. I, re I remember at the beginning of Ghostbusters, by the way, this is not a future talk. So at the beginning, so we're at the screen. It, it, in Hollywood, when you're doing a premiere, you get everybody in the industry in a theater, at least in those days you did. Today, probably not, and we can talk about that. But at the end, so it was the premiere of Ghostbusters, and I'm not sure any of you saw that, and everyone was like somber. You could hear a pin drop in the room, and Bill Murray goes, come on, lighten up, it's a comedy, just go with it. <laughs> That's how you want to leave a room. I will say that it is the most exciting time in my life for storytelling. You have a global platform, we used, when I started in the business, many of you weren't born, um, basically in the US we had three television channels and about five movie studios. And if you watch TV, it was pretty dumb. I mean, it was like least common denominator, let's sell to everybody, it's a, it's a 20 minute sitcom, let's see how many commercials we can stick in between jokes with blondes sometimes. Just, let's put it this way, it was not an elevated form of entertainment. Where we are today is that with time shifting, with the ability to choose what you want to see, when you want to see it, we have raised the bar in every form of entertainment. And if it does not engage, I mean, again, it's not about quality. It's about engagement and touching people intimately. If it doesn't grab you, you move on. And I think that is... You know, the coupling of that with the democratization of storytelling and of finding new creators makes it the most exciting time in the world. And what we need to do is to move squarely in the direction of bringing stories from all around the world so that people can actually see what life on this planet should be. So right now, we're seeing a change in how we experience storytelling, or if we're doing that within a theater, from our own homes, from different types of locations, within headsets. Can we back up a second before we dive into what storytelling will look like in the future? And can you recount for us what it was like when you know, these new technologies first came to Hollywood and how they made their way in? Well, I mean, you've got, you know, remember, you've got this massive pro you know, progression. You had silent film, you had talkie film, you had radio. Radio begat television. If you, for those who actually saw early American sitcoms, they were radio dramas with pictures. The sense of depth, the sense of quality, the sense of camera movement, the sense of sound has rapidly moved forward, but much more so, we went through the period of movies to television to pay television where actually you could have things that were not censored for the first time in America. I mean, you guys have, ne most of you have never known a world where the censorship, even in America, sort of stopped you from seeing stories told with the kind of veracity that you would hope they would be. And then we had VHS and Betamax moving to CDs and uh, to DVDs. And, but where we are now is we're in a completely digitized world, a digital world. We no longer are hampered by uh, constraints of a half an hour, or an hour, or two hours at the movies. We are able to tell stories, we are able to engage, we're able to sort of communicate in any form that engages. I mean, Jeffrey Katzenberg, um, who I, is a great friend and a, and a great entrepreneur, is launching uh, a new company, Wonderco, with, with Meg Whitman, who's my old classmate in business school, which is dedicated to high-quality storytelling in a short form. 
I think right now with VR, AR, games, the thing that I would tell you is that the tools of storytelling are as diverse as the platforms that you are engaging on, which is no longer television, it's any screen. And it's more than a screen, it's the, it's the physical environment with AR. And to me, where we are headed is that every, almost every business that you will touch through media and social media is, has the necessity of storytelling in it. And furthermore, where we are truly headed is a world where, at least I'll speak for the U.S., and I think it will be different outside the U.S., we're headed to a world where entertainment and media no longer are measured in terms of box office and ad revenue. It's measured as part of an Amazon-like system, an Apple-like system, a Comcast-like system when Disney launches its system, where effectively, if you look at Amazon as the most extreme example, they're going to control, or they're not going to control, they're going to present you a proposition to come into their universe, which started with retail, it now has pharmacy, it eventually will have finance, it will have travel, it will disintermediate brands, and it will have entertainment as your reward for being there. And your Amazon Prime entertainment will be free because they no longer measure things in the metrics of the old world. They measure how much it costs to acquire you as a customer, the average revenue per user per year, and the lifetime value of a customer. And they figure out how to make a bargain with you to keep you in their system so that if they made $300 from you last year at 20% margin, they want to make $400 from you next year at a 20% margin. The world has changed. And the sense of it's not just AI, it's not just algorithmic targeting, it's a sense of the change in your lives where so much comes together in a disruptive way that now gets put back together in a way that services you. And I think a lot of what we have to think about for the future is when we make that trade-off, and we will make that trade-off, and there's a lot of good to that trade-off, what are we losing, giving up? What are the perils of that trade-off? What is the sense that there may be five, seven, ten companies that are the front end for almost everything you do in your life, of which entertainment will be in the service of those systems? It sure sounds like a, a warning of a, a future, even a present, where we're controlled again by monopolies and we're moving back towards perhaps censorship, the censorship you said many of us have not lived with in our lifetimes. Is that the case? You know, I, I personally think that the people I know who run these businesses uh, do not have censorship in any way in their, in their, in their thought process. And, and I, I certainly don't want to be uh, a warning sign or a negative about it. I, the thing that I've talked about, which I, I, I wrestle with and you all need to wrestle with, is that everything technology has done that is good has something equal and opposite that is not good. And we're not going to change that. It's how we manage that societally, culturally, possibly governmentally, but it's really about values, it's really about how people deal with each other. The same 3D printing that can give a child an artificial limb that changes their life in a way that is unthinkable 20 years ago can print a 3D gun that's untraceable. You can't, there is, you, you are all more than bright enough and involved enough to know that any time you see something good, you can see the negative side of it as well. It, that's, that's the complexity of our lives. We're not rolling the clock back. What we have to do is embrace the good and societally, family-wise, values-wise, we have to make sure that as people, we, we push against the negative side of it so that we get the best of what technology, the best of what storytelling, the best of what people can give each other. It, it just went red, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> So it may not be that the people who are uh, working in these businesses or designing these systems have censorship in mind, but if authority is increasingly being expressed algorithmically, and by that I mean that decisions are being coded and then expressed for us by the choices that are presented. So in the case of Amazon, you have this free entertainment, but here's the entertainment you should want. It's telling us what we want. 
So is that not a degree of censorship by not telling us the things we shouldn't want and not letting us choose from them as well? You know, I, my own sense of, of and that's a, that's a really wonderful question because I, you know, people go, oh, Netflix, they use Amazon, they use these algorithms, and they, they can tell you what to make. Let me tell you right now, having, knowing all of the people who are in charge of all of these things pretty well, they fully understand that technology and the sort of data mining that they're doing may help them sell. It's also going to help them avoid mistakes. By the way, with or without their algorithmic targeting, we, 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 we were using data to sort of stop you from making mistakes. I mean, you, you, know, you, you can look just statistically in movies and say, well, you know, a certain type of drama you know, has never made more than $80 million at the box office. Well, then don't spend $150 million on that story. <laughs> it's just basic common sense. But the more I see how um, all of these companies, particularly the new platforms, are moving forward, the more they are relying on a balance between common sense as driven by their own systems and the genius of creators because ultimately it is a gift to tell a story. When I started in the business, if someone had come to me and said, I'm going to go make a movie about the 1924 British Olympic track team, one of the stars, there'd be no stars in the movie. You got a guy who's Jewish and doesn't really want to be Jewish, and he's running for Cambridge. And you got, you got this Scottish missionary who doesn't want to run on the Sabbath. And we got this Greek guy who's going to do the music. And the director's never really directed anything. And he got paid $60,000, Hugh Hudson. 11 Academy Awards later, Chariots of Fire is Chariots of Fire. And everybody knows that you cannot legislate genius. You, there is a reason that the most gifted storytellers are the most gifted storytellers. Wonderful. So on that note, we'll move to questions, but I'd like you all to think about how systems of storytelling are being designed for us, and we'll do a little throwback to the Roman Empire and their question to the world, which was, who will guard the guardians? So I encourage you all to take your own agency in your storytelling and your own agency right now in asking one to two questions, and then if you have more, finding uh, Sandy after to continue to, to learn from him and about the future. You know, from today. what I understand, by the way, you know, you got to love the fact, you know, just from a Hollywood guy, we're on a couch that looks like it should be like in a Hollywood bordello. <laughs> and you've had, on this, it's going to be on future talks, it's, it's this crazy thing. <laughs> So now in the all, future, we have to go back to the past. Now we're go. all going to be locked on a boat together, and I think that the, the, <laughs> the size of these cabins, if you get a cabin, is like a phone booth, so what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with one or two questions, we'll start right here in the front. And do you mind telling us your name first? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name's Emil. Um, I was wondering, where do you see the future of interactive film, where consumers can interact with the storyline and storytelling? Well, you know, I think that the real, just my own opinion, and this is just total guessing, but it's one of the things that actually excites me, is that I, I always thought that interactive storytelling where people were interacting with a screen, that's a game. So games basically are interactive storytelling, and the more we actually design games that have stories around them and we have collaborative effort, I mean, you know, massive multiplayer online games were always interactive storytelling to me, but I think that the future is fascinating because I, I look at um, you know three different areas that are that are interesting. One is I, I think networked VR will be a fascinating way to to sort of have interactive entertainment where you have a group activity. I am not a big fan of VR necessarily because I do think it's isolating to have the headset on, and you know I'm not quite ready to go into the Ready Player One universe where my dystopian universe is more interesting than my real world. <laughs> However, assuming we don't like trip people in the street, you know, grabbing, you know, Pokemon or Hogwarts characters, I think AR is really, uh, you know, a fascinating. It's a it's a rich storytelling environment. I, I think that it also will be heavily invested with rewards and and other emoluments that will give brands opportunities to engage. But I think that there. You know, to look at it as if it's not storytelling is, is, is to, to limit what its opportunity set will be. And I think that we have barely scratched the surface of that. And last but not least, for those that haven't done it, you know, live interactive entertainment, where you basically, you know, it's, it's the, the sense of 
being involved in the story in a live capacity where the story evolves and the audience actually drives the story, you know, it is much more local, but it's a lot of fun. And I think the, the reality is technology, whether it's like Rizwana with Peak or other things, by the way, those things will show up on Peak. Those things will show up when you go to a city and you, you're looking for what's exciting. Those will be, you know, the attractions that you're drawn to. And, uh, you know, to me, that, that is um, a, a true sense of sparking the creative juices. I hope we do it for kids in ways that are, uh, you know, highly engaging as well. Can you just elaborate briefly on what you mean by network VR? Um, I know it's a little scary, and it's kind of Woody Allen-ish, and you can go back to Sleeper, <laughs> but for those that live in that world. But eventually, I do think that it, the VR environment um, is highly immersive. It's more immersive than anything else. I think there are issues we have not worked through in terms of health. We, there, are not is, there are issues that we've not worked through in terms of other aspects of VR. But I also think that what will end up happening is that will be the Ready Player One universe. That's where you will be networked into a world so that you are completely immersed, the rest of the world is blocked out, and you will be able to sort of interact with others in a way that is, whether it's storytelling, game playing, other things, that it will be, uh, it, it will be communal VR as opposed to independent linear VR. Now, that said, I don't know when we get there. I don't know what the issues are with it. I will tell you that uh, for those that are working in VR, be, be somewhat cognizant. You know, we know that uh, digital technology and media actually can reshape uh, thought patterns in not just young people, but old people. We know large exposure to games has, you know, actually I think they've just coined the term gaming addiction as, a, as, as now a medical term that's been uh, formalized. I do think that we know that overexposure to, as an example, pornography has a negative impact in terms of how people rea in interact socially. Let's just assume that you amp that up, not necessarily in those areas, with an immersive environment that completely may change your brain chemistry while you're doing it. We'll find out what the limits are. But as I say, there's something negative, there's something positive. We got to figure out the positive side. I, and for, for my por point of view, VR is one of the greatest gifts because I think the medical applications of VR are quite significant. I think it, 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 in terms of stroke rehabilitation, in terms of you know, other conditions, I think that the application of VR has tremendous impact. Wonderful. We have time for one more question. Um, and if you have more questions we haven't yet answered, please stick around after. Uh, in the back with the hat. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rafi. I have a question. You said that people, yeah, you can't really predict who's going to be a good storyteller or like really create them. But I'm sure that after a production of a story, you have some like keys to make a good story or things not to do. So do you have any tips for people that are trying to maybe grow a movement? Look, I think, the, I think the structure of traditional movie storytelling, which is a three-act structure, and you could go read, you know, Sid Field's book, The Screenplay, or Robert McKee's book on story structure. You know, start at the beginning. Michael Mann used to say that writing television was carpentry. <laughs> and the, re the reality is, it is and it isn't. And what I would say is that uh, genius and what comes from the heart you really have to speak with authenticity. I think that the, the sense of people who are telling stories that have, whether it's through their imagination or their life experience, don't have authenticity, those are not going to be the, that which we remember. But study traditional structure and then modify it in any way. And I will tell you this, which I think is the biggest difference between when I started and where we are. We are headed down a path where the dialogue with the audience becomes part of the entertainment. So if you're going to do traditional storytelling, it is unidirectional in one way, and I think that's great because that's like writing a novel. You sit down and you do it. On the other hand, we are in dialogues with people, and we will create, and I think the people in this universe will create new forms of communication that are collaborative. I mean, one of the most exciting um, ventures that I'm involved with, and I encourage you to go there, is open screenplay. 
And you know, you go, oh, how are we going to have collaborative screenplay writing? Well, this company is going to figure it out. And while I spent a year pushing them away, because I didn't think it could be done, they finally convinced me that a sense of collaboration in the creative process, even in a screenplay, might yield something unexpectedly great. And, and I'm, I've, I'm bringing in major filmmakers to now coach people and to coach groups that have never collaborated before. And out of those collaborations, if 1%, 5%, 10% become long live creative partnerships, we've done something really terrific. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sandy, for joining us today. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> Thank you so much.